Hello, my name is Fred Wilbur. I'm with Windblown Studio, and this presentation is about the Raku process of uh, firing uh, pots. Uh, the Raku process is basically uh, taking a pot out of a kiln hot, why it's molten hot, and putting it in a reduction chamber. It started in the 16th century, uh, either in uh, Korea or Japan, depending upon who you read. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the process preparation and the firing process, and we will also be discussing safety. Uh, the preparation process, you will be using a raku clay. It's a special formulated clay to withstand thermal shock. Uh, other clay bodies can be used, but the success rate of those is uh, uh, not very good because of uh, thermal shock and cracking. Uh, you can either hand build pieces or you can throw them on the wheel. What you basically want is a piece that has a lot of surface because you're creating an artistic piece and uh, the surface will basically uh, demonstrate your either uh, design or your glaze. Uh, you will go ahead and bis fire them and wax the bottoms like you do normally before you glaze them. Uh, however, uh, with Raku glazes, you can uh, apply them the same way you do other glazes. You can dip them in a, a rack, in a bucket of glaze. You can pour them on, drizzle them on, sponge it on, dab it on, paint it on, spray it on, whatever technique you want to use to get it on the piece. You can use wax resist as a decorative process. Uh, where you have wax resist, like on your feet, uh, you will not have uh, glaze. And uh, where there's no glaze, when you put it in reduction chamber, the smoke in the chamber will basically turn that part of the pot black. Uh, here are three pieces that have uh, various parts of it uh, uh, with wax resist applied. The lamp at the bottom uh, has uh, wax resist on the top of the neck. You can see where it's uh, smoky black. The plate in the middle has a line of wax resist there and a couple other spots on it. And the piece at the top has had wax resist applied with uh, a brush and a sponge, and then the glaze applied over it uh, to create the tree. Uh, <clears throat> you can scratch through pe uh, glaze sometimes. Uh, where you scratch through, uh, it will also be smoked black. Uh, you can use multiple glazes on a piece. Uh, we do not recommend it. The results have not been satisfying. Uh, the glazed pieces have to, of course, dry before we fire them. And uh, just one more thing, we do want to point out that uh, many of these glazes have uh, crazing or cr uh, form cr uh, cracks in the glaze. It's, uh, the smoke permeates and turns black. Uh, that's a normal process, uh, and it's an artistic technique you may want to take advantage of. Uh, the firing process, uh, we do uh, preheat pieces uh, before we put them in a kiln, uh, again, to avoid thermal shock. We fire the kiln outside for safety reasons to uh, 1,500 to 1,800 degrees, depending upon what we're trying to do. Uh, the glazes actually go through uh, three or four steps of maturation. Uh, they start in a dry state. Uh, around 1,300 degrees, that dry powder will turn liquid. Uh, and then uh, as it increases in temperature, uh, different glazes go through a process called the ugly stage. Uh, around 1,500 degrees, you'll get uh, eruptions and uh, bubbles on it. Uh, it can turn very ugly. Uh, you'll think the piece will never be beautiful. But somewhere around 1,600 to 1,700, the pieces uh, smooth out, the glaze smooths out and turns shiny. Uh, and that time, it's ready for extraction out of the kiln. We do extract pieces out of the kiln hot. Uh, we use tongs and gloves. The heat in that kiln can be very hot. It can burn you. Uh, we do not uh, recommend, uh, uh, we'll talk later about safety, we don't recommend uh, certain clothing or long hair uh, around this uh, kind of uh, heat. Uh, once we take them out of the kiln with tongs, we put them in a uh, bucket uh, immediately with newspaper in it. The hot pot uh, hits that newspaper, creates fire. We put some paper on top sometimes, and then we put a lid on the bucket. And when we put that lid on the bucket, it creates uh, uh, a, uh, 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 an environment that is starved for oxygen. The fire still wants to burn. It needs oxygen to do that. And it starts taking oxygen out of that glaze surface. And that's what creates all the various coloring techniques. Uh, it's a process that is not 100% controlled. In fact, you have very little control over it. So there's a lot of unpredictability in uh, raku firing. Uh, after it's been in the can for about 30 minutes, we take them out. They're still hot. We use tongs to take them out. We let them cool, and we clean them up with basically soap, uh, 
Comet cleanser, a scrubby works uh, to clean off the uh, burnt newspaper. Uh, <clears throat> the results are vary depending upon how it's reduced and uh, the glazer use and uh, many other variables, many of which uh, we don't control. You will have three glazes available to you. Uh, you'll have one called Rogers Black that is a luster glaze. Uh, can turn red, green, orange, copper color. Uh, the more reduction on this glaze, the better. This glaze likes to burn hot. It likes to mature around 1650 uh, degrees to 1700 degrees. Uh, there's a white crackle glaze. Uh, where there's glaze, uh, the glaze will actually uh, crack uh, and smoke will permeate those cracks and there's two types of cracks. There's uh, the large boulder cracks and then there's finer, more uh, lighter colored cracks. Uh, Rick's turquoise is a glaze that, uh, depending again about how it's reduced, uh, can turn red, oranges, uh, greens, purples. If you do not reduce it heavy, it will actually come out turquoise. Uh, there is another process that we uh, uh, will try to do. is called horsehair. Uh, you actually, uh, horsehair is taking the piece out of the kiln hot. Instead of putting it in a reduction chamber, uh, we actually put it on a shelf uh, and apply horsehair to it while it's hot. Because it has no uh, glaze uh, surface on the horsehair, we typically like to make that pot as smooth as possible. And there's a technique that we'll demonstrate later in our demonstrations uh, about burnishing and how to get that piece as smooth as possible. But basically, we take the kiln, uh, the piece out of the kiln hot with tongs again. We put it on a uh, preheated shelf. Uh, sometimes we put a, a tissue in, inside the piece to smoke it black. Uh, sometimes we glaze the piece like the one below shows. Uh, this is a Rogers black glaze. It looks different because it's not been reduced. Uh, <clears throat> Why the pot's hot? Uh, we actually touch it with horsehair. Uh, this is a little dangerous process. Sometimes we use uh, pliers or tongs, uh, needle nose pliers, and touch it with horsehair. The temperature range where horsehair works is pretty narrow. It's somewhere between uh, 1450 and uh, 1575 or 1600 degrees. Uh, if it's too hot, the horsehair just burns away and smokes and uh, does nothing. If it's the pot's too cold, the horsehair just lays there. But if it's at the right temperature, the horsehair actually burns itself into the clay body. And then later on, after it cools and you clean it off, uh, you see the results similar to this. Now, the, the lighter colored parts is where the smoke rise. You can actually use that as a technique for uh, artistic purposes. Uh, the uh, darkest part is where horsehair has been burned in the body. On this particular piece, you'll see at the upper right-hand corner, uh, actually has a crack in it from thermal shock. Uh, cracks are of something that happens with uh, raku processing, whether you use horsehair or uh, other pieces. Uh, it's nice to have your pieces made uniformly uh, wall thickness. Uh, very similar to what happens in electric kiln or gas kiln. If you have a thick piece on your pot, it expands at a different rate than a thinner piece, and that creates uh, that, that expansion difference creates stress and cracks. Uh, with Raku, the thermal shock uh, is just more exaggerated. Let's talk about safety. <clears throat> no synthetic clothing is recommended. Uh, nylon, polyester, and heat doesn't go well together. You do not want your shirt melting on your body. Uh, shorts and sandals are not good because, frankly, they don't uh, protect you much. And long hair and hot kilns don't go well together. We don't need anybody's hair to be singed off. Uh, you do not want to breathe the fumes in the cans. It's toxic. If you find yourself in a smoky area, uh, hold your breath. But we typically try to move those cans away from where people are when they're smoking. Uh, we, the cans are uh, the pots are still hot when they come out of the cans, uh, so we use gloves for that. But we never use gloves with molten pot, uh, uh, pots. There are some videos on YouTube where people have done that. I've never done it, and I certainly don't recommend it. It's a very dangerous process, and frankly, it's one that's uh, not necessary. I don't think. Uh, <clears throat> Raku pieces are not food safe. Their function is to be beautiful. Uh, when they in the 1500s, when the uh, Japanese were making tea bowls, they were using glazes that were uh, had lead content in it. So they had a couple things going against them. Number one is they used a, a low firing glaze like raku process. 
Uh, the pieces were very porous. Uh, the glazes had lead in them, and that may have attributed to the fact that they didn't live very long. <clears throat> uh, one of the things on safety, the kilns don't look hot when they're in the daylight, but if you look at them at night, you can see the heat. They are very, very hot. Uh, hot things deserve respect and very careful treatment. Uh, in case you didn't notice, that was a hot thing there. Uh, any questions? Uh, I will be posting this video uh, on our website and I will be giving uh, your instructor a pointer to it so you can get access to it later. Thank you very much.